Thank you all so much for coming. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the office, the startup, and the marriage, my marriage. First, the office. Remember when we used to walk into a building in our shoes and our fancy clothes and say good morning to everyone, the same people every day, and get coffee at the place next door? As someone who's had a, both an office job and a stay-at-home job, I sort of feel a mixture of longing and nostalgia and revulsion for both. Um, I love to work in my pajamas, but I also love office lunch. Um, and I love the quiet of working alone, but also the buzz of sitting around the table and having a conversation with colleagues. I guess the pandemic has made us all aware of the ways in which we took this ritual for granted. How we privilege the physical office over all other forms of working. And this was especially challenging for women, especially working mothers who had to prove that working from home made them just as productive as those who showed up at the office five days a week. And of course, as we know, that wasn't the only thing about the office that made it unfriendly for women. I'm sure you've all read the articles and seen the studies about office culture, that it's deeply sexist. It's, it has a bro culture that excludes women. The golfing, the way women are defined in their recommendation letters as collaborative and cooperative rather than assertive and driven the way that men are described. Everything from the air conditioning to the way tasks are allocated, who makes the coffee, who takes notes at a meeting. Women have always had it hard in the workplace. I don't obviously have the solution to sexism in the workplace, but what I will say is that we have to begin by admitting that sexism is not the byproduct of office life, something unpleasant that we have to render less unpleasant in the midst of a system that basically works, but rather that sexism and patriarchy are the reason the office exists. The workplace was a creation of differentiated roles between men and women, men walking into offices, leaving everything else behind while women stayed at home and looked after the household and the children. Once we come to accept that, we can start to change it. In other words, sexism is baked into the very system, the very structure of office life. One would not exist without the other. My own relationship to the office happened because my husband founded a company, a startup, about 10 years ago. Um, it was actually a few weeks before we got married. He registered his new company, uh, Roly, with Company's House. Um, so our marriage and the startup were born right around the same time. Um, a few months after that, we found an actual physical office. It was a renovated warehouse that used to house a conceptual furniture company. Um, I remember when we went around to see it for the first time, we were amazed by the polished concrete floors, the high ceilings, the East London cool vibe of it all. Um, and the couple who had run the business together had also lived in the building. And in a strange echo, we also found an apartment, not in the office, but like a five minute walk away. And so he started building the business and I found myself really attracted to this office. And I found myself spending more and more time there, helping with everything from hiring the team to writing out the holiday policy, writing some of the copy for the website. Um, you know, and at first everything was really great. We would go to work together and then we would come home and we would keep talking about the startup. And then we would wake up and eat breakfast and then talk about the startup and go to work. Um, and one of our first team members, who is actually now the COO of our company, um, also lived with us for a while. Then he actually like slept in the office for a few months. And then when he got married, moved in next door. Anyway, our lives were like a kind of mashup of work and home. And like I said, things went really well at first. We kind of loved blurring those lines and it didn't feel like a job. It felt like an extension of ourselves, like a concrete real life expression of our passions. Um, you know, we had both started out as academics and gotten tired of the rarefied air of academic life. And I was even sometimes a little bit tired of being a writer, although I love being a writer, but, you know, it's five years between when you start writing and when a book comes out and there's a lot of angst. And I just love the kind of lightness and um, entertainment of going to an office and hanging out with people and just sort of, yeah, I, I love that sort of collective experience. But then the inevitable happened. Um, we had children and everything changed. And this is so true for so many women. 
Um, it wasn't just that people started treating me differently. I mean, one thing was that they would, people would often ask where my children were as if I had somehow forgotten them on the street on my way to work. Um, or suddenly, you know, and suddenly I had hours at home on my own while my husband had to go out into the world. I wasn't just looking after a baby and keeping him alive, but there was all this other stuff that came with it. I had to remember his doctor's appointments, when he had to get his vaccinations. I had to remember to sign him up for nursery, which I totally forgot to do for like two years. And anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, so it was a lot. It was a, a whole new world that had opened up to me and I was quite overwhelmed by it as many women are. Um, in the meantime, of course, the startup was as demanding as ever and it started calling my husband to the West Coast for business trips. So there were long flights away, you know, long flights, there were weeks away. Um, parenting was stressful, the nights were excruciating and the business was also painful and demanding and excruciating. We started to argue about who had the harder job. And even now it's difficult to say who was right. I mean, obviously I think it was me, but you know, um, there's an argument to be made on both sides. I could see how challenging it was. And you know, we, the thing is that we had made an agreement that we were going to, um, raise this child equally. And we both had the very best intentions. Um, one of the things that rankled, and I have to say this, uh, I have to tell you the story as my earbuds kind of start to fall out because I'm so excited and they're kind of popping out. Anyway, the thing that, one of the things that really rankled is that we could never ever go on a holiday. Okay, so we kept canceling all these vacations and once in a while we would take one. And I remember this one in particular, um, we, we flew to Bangladesh where my parents were, we dropped off the children and we went to Thailand and this was very exciting. And we, we had this beach holiday and it was really amazing. We even turned our phones off a few times. Um, and on the last day, as we were driving to the airport, we decided to stop at a ceramics factory by the side of the road. And as we were pulling up into this, uh, you know, by the side of the road, my husband said, um, I just need to make a quick phone call. It's just going to be five minutes. I'll be right there. So I go into the factory and he's kind of on the other side making his phone call. And I start to, and we decided to buy mugs for our kitchen. Okay. So mugs. So I'm walking around, I look through the plates and everything. And finally I find the mugs and it's like five minutes and it's 10 minutes and it's 15 minutes. And I think, okay, I better start making some decisions. So I pick up a few options and I sort of go up to him and he's on the phone. And I started waving these mugs in front of his face. And he's kind of like trying to shoo me away and say like, do not show me these mugs. And I just started then chasing him down the aisles of this factory with these mugs in my hand. And of course he just couldn't make a mug decision in the middle of this very, what turned out to be a very tense phone call. Um, and I bought like the worst mugs in the world. And every time I look at them, I'm reminded that I cannot even make the smallest decisions while also trying to be a startup wife. Um, and I started to think about myself as a startup wife. I was married to this person and this person was kind of married to this other thing to which I was also connected. We were in a weird sort of threesome. We went everywhere together. We did everything together and our fates were tied to each other. Um, what kind of enraged me was that I felt that I was living out the same tired rituals that women had played out for generations before me. And yet alongside that, I was part of a culture that was engaged in a new kind of myth-making. And, and the fun, that's the foundational myth of startup culture, the myth of disruption. We are told that technology is out to disrupt everything from the way we do our laundry, to how we order a pizza, to really fundamental things like how we connect with our loved ones around the world. We, you know, technology is talked about as life-changing, as revolutionary, as transformational. And within companies, um, the talk, the vocabulary, it's like, we're going to kill it. We're gonna crush it. There's a monster valuation. There's a huge exit. And of course, the much longed for unicorn. If you don't know what a unicorn is in tech speak, it means your company is worth a billion dollars. Um, technology in the startup world also emphasizes the role of the visionary founder, usually a man who will perform amazing miracles, changing people's lives and making his investors a shitload of money. We are used to imagining our prophets and messiahs as men. And this is just a recasting of that same old trope. I thought that blurring the lines was going to give me an escape hatch to somehow get around these, these traditional roles that I was being cast into. 
I also thought that the startup was going to be a different way of working. We were making it all up as we went along. Why not make this part of it up too? But I realized that that was never going to happen. There is a myth of self-creation that comes with technological progress. And yet, as I discovered in my own life, the structural forces at work are powerful and strong, and they will override any flimsy attempt at disruption. Real change can only begin when we acknowledge the depth of the problem, the pull of traditional roles, the ever-turning wheel of patriarchy. As a woman, for me, it means taking up the space to say that I am part of a system that needs to be shaken to its very core. When I looked around me, when I look around me, I repeatedly see examples of women being left behind. And in fact, the more demanding work becomes, the less visible women become. Um, my agent once said to me, when we were talking about work, she said, we're surrounded by corpses, um, which is kind of a morbid thing to say, but I, it has, is a phrase that has always stuck with me. All these women that kind of leave the workforce after having children or just kind of disappear. At the same time, when our startup was facing any kind of challenge, which startups inevitably do, we had to keep emphasizing the narrative of success, disruption, growth, and winning. So what did I do? Well, lucky for me, I'm a writer, which means when I have an experience, however complex or negative it is, I get to put it somewhere. And so I wrote a novel about being a startup wife. But amazingly, instead of giving the protagonist my life, I gave her my alternate fantasy life. I made her the founder and visionary of the startup. Um, I made her be the one that comes up with the idea, who faces all the uphill battles of trying to make the company work. And I found that process enormously cathartic and joyful because I got to create someone who did things that I felt that I couldn't do. Um, I also gave her a really sharp tongue. I made her say fuck a lot, which helped me to channel some of the anger and rage and some of the lines that I had been storing up, but I never got to use. And obviously, of course, not everyone who feels the yoke of sexism in the workplace can write a novel. Although if you're out there, I highly recommend it for its therapeutic effects. So what happens next? I think we know that the office will never be the same again. Whatever we return to, the last 18 months have changed our relationship to work forever. For the most part, this is a good thing. Women have proven once and for all that being present in the workplace isn't directly related to productivity. It's my hope that we can use this experience to make a fundamental shift to the way we approach matters of equality in the workplace. It isn't just about flexible hours, being allowed to work from home, being more tolerant, tolerant of babies like Zoom bombing meetings, hiring more women, but a fundamental cultural shift. Love isn't going to make that shift. My husband and I adore each other and we had the best of intentions. We wanted a relationship of equality, but I realized that we can love each other and want equality and it doesn't necessarily change anything. Where we work and how we work isn't going to change that. We have to acknowledge that we are part of a system that has been in place for millennia and that in order to recast that system, we have to challenge the very myths that are at their core. The myth of technological disruption, the myth of work-life balance, the myth of the visionary male CEO. I realize that being a startup wife is just like being any other kind of wife. And it's up to me to change what that means. Thank you so much, everyone.